on the smoking section and uh, my name is Steve Helfer and this show has been on for a long long time and very happy to see CTV that we have it on oh let's see um, trying to look for our smoker of the week here uh, who I thought was on uh, this screen and let's just see if we can get him up. Oh boy, no, I don't think we're going to have a smoker of the week this week. Um, don't know where he went. Uh, but I can try to get him up. Let's get him up right now because I, I really like him. And I think if you can bear with me. Since I don't have a guest, I would like to have a smoker of the week, so let's let's see how we're going here. And this is Pine Top Perkins, uh, who was born in Belzoni, Mississippi in 1913. And he is one of the top or he was, I'm afraid he's gone now, uh, he left this earthly plane at the age of 98, uh, but he was one of the very classic blues players in the United States up until when he died seven years ago. And I was reading an article that at the 2009 Pine Top Perkins Homecoming Blues Festival in Clarksdale, Mississippi, Pine Top then 96, sat quietly at a table smoking cigarettes. Uh, he had started smoking at the age of nine, so let me just think if I can get that. That means he smoked for about 89 years, which is, I think, close to a record as far as uh, elderly smokers that um, I'm familiar with. And um, According to Hugh Southard, who was his manager, his tastes were very simple. Two cheeseburgers, apple pie, a cigarette, and a pretty girl was all he wanted. So Pine Top Perkins uh, died at the age of 98 in 2011 uh, and evidently smoked probably pretty healthfully because I think uh, he was touring right up until the point of his death. Uh, at the age of 98. So that's our smoker of the week. Um, sorry for the uh, problems getting him up there. Um, recently, on our Facebook page, uh, we posted a very interesting article from the Cambridge Day, or actually the title of the newspaper, I, we would call it, is Cambridge Day. It's a very well done online uh, newspaper here in Cambridge and there were some very encouraging news about the situation of the Cambridge Housing Authority smoking ban and evidently the director of op operations, the new director of operations there who's a man named Dean Petruzzi uh, thinks that the ban is really being overly hard on smokers uh, and that you can't get people to quit just like that, supposedly because it's an addiction. But um, then again, we know, uh, everybody knows thousands upon thousands of people who smoke stopped smoking and they didn't have any withdrawals or anything like that. But I think rather than being an addiction, I think people intuitively know that or believe that smoking is something that enhances their life rather than detracts from it. Uh, then again, it may come with certain risks, I won't deny that, uh, but I have seen persons who have quit smoking 
uh, and whose health actually precipitously declined when they quit smoking. All kinds of mental issues came up, weight issues came up, along with the weight issues, joint issues, uh, and they were just not as happy or as easygoing as they had been. And they may not have been easygoing to begin with. So uh, if you take someone who is inclined towards nervousness or uh, high strongness, certainly, and that person quits smoking, uh, that person's going to get uh, even worse in that condition. I remember uh, when I was a very, very young child, my parents, they must have quit smoking about, let me just think, what age was I? I think they quit smoking when I was about seven years old. And they both were smokers. Uh, I think they both enjoyed smoking a lot. Uh, they both smoked non-filters because at that point in time, you really didn't have uh, filter cigarettes. Filter cigarettes really didn't come into the 50s. But I remember my sister telling me that both of my parents, that our parents became more uh, more high strung, after more nervous after they quit smoking. I know they both had uh, weight problems, not terrible weight problems, but some weight problems, and uh, I'm sure they both put on pounds. But fortunately, both my parents lived to be 85, even though they had a fairly long history of smoking. So, but not to get too uh, off track there. Um, but I still can't help mentioning that um, I remember when we had my grandmother's wake uh, in our home, which was in then in Scarsdale, New York, and uh, my parents had a big party. My grandmother had died at the age of 88, so it was not uh, what you would call a tragic death, but she had, uh, my mother had a big party. It was kind of a wake, and it was just crowded with people, uh, and this was in 1958, which of course is six years before the Surgeon General's report of 64. So the whole house was filled with smoke and people drinking, and uh, as a child then, um, I guess I was about 11, I was 11 at that time, I just got the feeling that this whole house, that there was such a warm feeling, everybody was kind of I don't think they were just talking about my grandmother. They were having a good time remembering my grandmother and uh, socializing. And people were just so relaxed. And the house was filled with smoke. And everyone was just thoroughly enjoying themselves. And I think uh, you don't have that kind of level of easiness or uh, sociability uh, when we are living where tobacco is considered a taboo. Uh, for example, I just went to a very nice coffee house brewery combination on Broadway called the called uh, Longfellows, I think. And it was very nice, but the, the atmosphere was a little... I enjoyed myself, and people were enjoying themselves. I don't dispute that. But the atmosphere was a little antiseptic. And I was also at uh, the barn uh, on Monday, the day of the snow, and, uh, excuse me, yesterday was the day of the snow, and it was, all, likewise, it was very quiet, it was very pleasant, it was an open mic there, but I think people would be much more relaxed if they were enjoying the many benefits that tobacco gave them. Well, back to the Cambridge Housing Authority, so Dean Petruzzi, uh, thinks that um, the smoking ban should be modified, which is, of course, a good idea. And uh, the, the Cambridge Day is really, really honest and, and straightforward here. Um, although they write in Cambridge Day, although almost 80% of residents who answered the, the survey said they wanted to live in smoke, it to, they were in favor of the smoking ban. Uh, opponents of the ban dominated the discussion. And it was really, uh, the opponents 
non-smokers, smokers, innocent bystanders really were opposed to this ban. Um, and they spoke at every meeting. They dominated every discussion. And, you know, this comes to this idea that the survey, now the survey that the Cambridge Housing Authority did, as Bill Cunningham has pointed out so many times, was, you know, kind of smoke-free housing. And, of course, when you frame the discussion as smoke-free, uh, it sounds so nice, rather than banning people from smoking in their homes, rather than being intrusive, coercive, authoritarian. Uh, so uh, the survey itself, on the outside of the survey, had many of these kind of really, um, you know, types of suggestive uh, ways for people to respond. And then again, when you had the survey, only one out of five tenants uh, responded to it. Uh, so how accurate is it? Is it? I think it's quite likely that those tenants who responded to the survey uh, were people who might be in favor of the ban. And again, it was only one out of five tenants responded, and then supposedly 80% of them were in favor of it, but uh, they were, it was very suggestive of, you know, how they were supposed to respond. So it was really a very, um, let's say, a survey done in bad faith. And so here we said, starting August 1st, 2014, so wow, that's a while back now. I mean, that was really a very long battle. Cambridge Citizens for Smokers' Rights was very active in it. And um, one thing that, even though the ban was introduced and uh, we did not win that fight entirely, again, as Bill Cunningham has pointed out, and Bill is one of the members of Cambridge Tenant, uh, the Cambridge Alliance of Cambridge Tenants, uh, they were originally going to ban it uh, everywhere on the grounds, uh, but the Cambridge Housing Authority, because of all of the pushback, said that there would be designated areas. Now, I don't know if there really are designated areas on, uh, you know, Cambridge Housing Authority uh, property right now. This is something, again, that you get an agency to agree to certain things uh, and you do a lot of, um, a uh, you know, a lot of discussion, a lot of opposition, etc. But whether these were really put there or not is, um, is something that I don't personally know. So that's why I'm hoping to have uh, Bill Cunningham come on the program. And um, I mean, one thing they do mention is that the, uh, you know, in the, uh, uh, on the Board of Commissioners of the uh, Cambridge Housing Board, the only member of the board uh, who was on, uh, who was a tenant, uh, was a woman, and she may still be on the board, is a woman named Victoria Berglund. And is she said that this ban was too harsh because you have, uh, many smokers who are elderly. I mean, I know you're not supposed to become elderly if you're a smoker, but there are many elderly smokers in Cambridge housing uh, and saying to them that unless you go out, like, for example, in a day like yesterday with blizzard conditions uh, to have a cigarette, um, you're going to be evicted, is a pretty coercive and certainly not something that is very... Uh, sympathetic to the tenants who smoke. And, you know, these days with this whole opioid crisis, uh, we're supposed to look at opioid addiction as a, as a disease, which I don't buy, by the way, but this is a brain disease that uh, people have no control over themselves. Um, but we're supposed to be very, very sympathetic to anybody who has got a heroin or an opioid addiction, but then if it comes to smoking, we're supposed to treat smokers like pariahs, and that's supposed to be 
uh, in the public health field, that's supposed to be a good thing to treat people badly, uh, to make them go outside where their life and limb are in danger. Uh, and that, you know, the thing about public health is public health has always had this problem. And I don't deny that people in the field of public health have done some very good things. Uh, but it's always been something whereby they tend to violate the Hippocratic Oath, which of course says, first, do no harm. And people in public health are very often thinking, well, of large populations. Uh, but in the field of medicine, and certainly with the Hippocratic Oath, you're supposed to look at each person individually. And you don't say, well, we can reduce smoking rates in this country by forcing elderly people out in blizzard conditions and thereby uh, sending a message to other people that there'll be no sympathy for them. That's not treating people as individuals. That's treating like whole population levels. And public health has always had this problem. Uh, you know, probably the most egregious the uh, problem they had in the public health field was, of course, experimenting on uh, men who had syphilis and not treating some of them, even though they knew they could treat them uh, and help them, but they didn't want to treat them because they wanted to see, well, how does syphilis run and maybe in terms of large numbers of people we'll be able to help people this way. That's, of course, the famous Tuskegee. Um, experiments that were done uh, on black and white prisoners in the South by public health officials uh, into, uh, I believe it was into the late, early 70s, and even though uh, people in the medical profession said that this was unethical and violated the Hippocratic Oath, it wasn't until uh, it got into the newspapers that public health officials did anything about it. So the, the history of public health has got a lot of, um, has been tainted in some ways and in many ways. And I think here with this uh, effort to reduce smoking rates by attacking individual smokers uh, is an example of something that is highly unethical. Um, but, you know, uh, of course, there is one person on the board, um, Naomi Steven. I don't know who she is. I suppose we could Google her and find out. She's concerned about backpedaling. When we put this policy through, people were really happy, Steven said. Well, you know, if people were happy, I don't know how she found that out, because certainly, other than a very, very few tenants, uh, like Donald Sutherfield, who will be on this program, I have to admit he was for the tenant ban, he was for the smoking ban, but other than a very, very few, um, I don't think people were very happy. So I don't know how she would know that. And, but I'm hoping that this will come about and uh, we, will, we will be able to see some discussion. This is supposed to uh, occur uh, possibly uh, sometime this summer where Dean Petruzzi will uh, review the ban, see perhaps um, what can be done um, about making things a little more commodious, particularly for elderly smokers and for those persons uh, with mental disabilities and um, who really depend on smoking uh, for their mental stability. And uh, also, uh, you know, there is really no scientific evidence uh, that being exposed to such low doses of secondhand smoke has any ill effect whatsoever. And uh, I, as far as I know, there has never been uh, such a study, and uh, so when they say uh, that we are doing this for health reasons, uh, they're really not doing it for health reasons. They're just doing it to put the screws 
um, on smoke ears and uh, this, as we have noted on this program, uh, this, how does this hurt society as a whole? Well, when you coerce a, a large group of people, uh, who, and there are still a large number of Americans who smoke, many millions, um, and you treat them poorly, this kind of is a, sets an example on how you treat or how we treat everybody. When, as people like to say, when you deprive anybody or one group of people of their civil rights, uh, it has a, an effect on the society as a whole and uh, is uh, tainted in that regard. So that we will see, we're going to come on the summer. I intend to have Bill Cunningham come on the program. He hasn't been on in a while. And I guess Donald Sutterfield, who uh, is a, uh, a tenant who is in favor of the ban, is supposed to be scheduled on the show. So I'd be very interested in seeing uh, what he feels about this. Unfortunately, we were um, not there uh, at this hearing. Um, I don't know why we weren't notified, but you know, I'm not so sure we would have had a place to talk in it anyway. But again, this uh, Petruzzi says zero tolerance is not appropriate uh, when you have an addiction. Well, I use that word addiction a lot, but I don't know if zero tolerance is really um, something that is appropriate in public housing when uh, it's kind of people's last refuge from the street. And uh, as, uh, you know, as my uh, fellow Cambridge Citizens for Smokers' Rights member has pointed out uh, there are a lot of people uh, with mental illness, for example, who don't go in to uh, get the help they need from uh, because in psychiatric facilities and even on the grounds of psychiatric hospitals, uh, many times they have banned smoking and uh, we've been very active in that part and I must say that even we have gotten one of the world's um, most, uh, let's say, active anti-smokers, Simon Chapman from Australia, uh, I had, must give him credit that he's been very voicing, very vocal that there are limits to the level at which you can coerce people and that these limits, uh, that when public health exceeds these, just as when they exceed what they did in Tuskegee, uh, and for example, uh, what public health did with experimenting with AIDS drugs on foster children in the 90s, which was a violation of all kinds of medical ethics, and what public health did in terms of forced sterilizations for about 40 years in the United States. We are uh, going not from what is medical, but to what is authoritarian and totalitarian. And this, you know, people get blinded in public health by this idea that we can make a society, uh, a kind of scientific utopia, where everybody toes the line and anybody who doesn't becomes an enemy of the state. And uh, we've seen this though with smokers. And while I'm not particularly sympathetic to the idea of there being such a slippery slope, because um, I, you know, people have been predicting or saying, well, they're going to go after drinkers or they're going to go after the obese. Uh, I haven't seen that happen in my 20 years of experience. Uh, it seems that uh, drinking is still pretty cool um, and you know I see all these programs from the BBC in England where you don't see anybody smoking but they're putting back quite a bit of alcohol uh, I think part of this is I mean I think part of the reason that um, the uh, smoking has been so successful is that people it tends always to be a habit of people that don't have all of that much money. Uh, smoking is something that, you know, even though uh, 
cigarettes are very expensive today relative to what they used to be. Uh, you can buy a package of cigarettes for 10 bucks, whereas uh, if you go to a, a bar in Cambridge, it's pretty hard to get out. Uh, you know, even a couple of beers, uh, it ends, you, ends up costing you more than that. And so it is, it, it is definitely much a very class-related issue. Uh, and while I don't agree with the slippery soap, there is this idea of you take a water and you put a frog in it, and you heat it gradually and gradually, and the frog ends up boiling to death uh, without jumping out, because you increase this incrementally, these restrictions, these um, kinds of uh, gradual uh, removal of people's autonomy, and they don't even notice. And I think that's happening in our society today, at least in, certainly with tobacco, but because, you know, it would at one time it would have been unthinkable that you would not be able to smoke in a bar. Now, even smokers say, oh, well, I can understand smoking and, you know, banning smoking in bars, but I don't understand it in public parks. Well, it's all a matter of increment getting used to this kind of coercion. Thanks for watching the show. We'll be on next week, 7 p.m. Good night.